This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. The 2020 census will be here before we know it. The official U.S. population count includes a practice that some say is outdated and should be abolished. They're referring to when states count inmates as residents of the town where they're imprisoned instead of their hometown. Advocates pushing for this to be changed say the practice unfairly awards political power to regions that host prisons. Now, the NAACP is suing the state of Connecticut over the practice known as prison gerrymandering. Coming up, we'll learn about the first of its kind lawsuit. We'll also review the Supreme Court's recent Janus v. AFSCME ruling. What does it mean for the future of public sector unions? It impacts more than 43,000 state employees alone. We'll find out how Connecticut and and local local municipal officials are preparing. But first, July was slated as the month when recreational marijuana would be available for legal purchase in Massachusetts. So does that mean pot shops are open and selling? Not quite. For more, we wanted to welcome back to the show Dan Adams. He's a cannabis reporter at the Boston Globe. Dan, welcome to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Thanks for having me. So tell us the latest. A a lot of people uh, are assuming that starting July 1, these pot shops would be up and running in Massachusetts. That isn't exactly uh, correct. So what's happening in terms of finding retailers who are licensed to sell recreational pot? That's right. Not exactly yet. And uh, where is the weed? That is the question on everyone's lips up here. Um, And look, it's, it's a bit of a complicated situation. We were slated to have sales begin on July 1st. Uh, but we've had a series of delays. The legislature changed the law here in Massachusetts and uh, pushed back the start of legal sales by about six months. And uh, it's just been a, a process of writing regulations, reviewing applications, um, you know, doing background checks on these operators, making sure they don't have uh, uh, you know, convictions that would disqualify them from running these businesses, um, doing inspections of the facilities. And uh, there's also the question of local control in Massachusetts. Uh, cities and towns have a great deal of power to zone these businesses, to decide where they belong within their communities, or even to ban them. Um, and they also need to sign contracts contracts with all of these uh, marijuana operators that call for some payments going from the company to the town. And those are taking some time to negotiate. So there's been a series of sort of small hurdles. And the uh, net result is we're not likely to have a store open here. Uh, I would say, you know, end of this month, maybe even early next month um, is, is what's likely at this point. Now, uh, uh, reading your reporting, uh, on Monday, the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission uh, issued its first license for recreational uh, for a recreational pot store. Tell us who that retailer is. That's right. We do have one store with a provisional license at this point. It's uh, just outside Worcester in the town of uh, Leicester. Uh, the company is called Cultivate, uh, sort of a group of local businessmen. Uh, the president of the company, his uh, father owns a ski resort up in Maine. And uh, so at this point, they've got a provisional license. They're, they're an existing medical dispensary, so they're already open for people who are registered patients with the state. Uh, but in terms of selling to any adult who's not a patient, um, anyone 21 plus, they're still a few weeks away from that. They're going to have to have their facility inspected. There's also the question of where they'll source their products from. Um, this company, Cultivate, uh, they grow marijuana and they process it into edibles and lotions and other products uh, sort of on site there in Leicester. But the other aspects of their operation, the cultivation, the processing, those uh, operations need separate licenses, and they don't yet have those. It's possible they could source products from uh, another supplier that does have a license. The state is starting to license some other companies. Um, So it remains to be seen exactly how that will work out. They may not even be the first store to open if another retailer gets uh, a provisional license and completes its inspections faster. It won't necessarily be this store. But the hope of the Cannabis Control Commission here is that uh, they're going to get into a rhythm with this licensing and that each week uh, they have a weekly meeting. uh, They're going to start churning through some of these applications, you know, dealing with two, three, four of them at a time. So we will see this industry start to get built out, but it's certainly not going to be uh, an overnight thing. No one's going to flip a switch um, and we're going to have marijuana stores everywhere. Uh, logistically, does it make sense that uh, the retailers that will um, possibly be applying for these licenses to sell are uh, also already in uh, business as medical marijuana dispensaries? 
That's right. Uh, the existing medical marijuana dispensaries, and, and uh, just for your background for your listeners, we voted for medical marijuana here in Massachusetts in 2012. The dispensary started to open a couple of years later. Um, so now some of these operators have been around, uh, you know, two, three years. They, they're already up and running. They're growing marijuana. They have retail stores set up. Um, you know, they've, they've passed their fire code inspection. They have relationships with the local officials and uh, police and, and fire and all those folks. Um, and so, yes, logistically, it makes sense for them to be among the first. Uh, new operators have uh, additional hurdles to jump over. Uh, that's not to say that it's seamless for the medical operators. Um, there's a number of things to be worked out there. And actually, for, for a period of time, for the rest of this year here, it's looking like these stores will be regulated by two agencies at once. You've got the Department of Public Health, which oversees the medical marijuana program, and you've got the Cannabis Control Commission, which oversees the recreational program. Uh, and so those two agencies are going to need to work together to figure out, for example, how a plant may be transferred from the tracking system of uh, medical marijuana to the tracking system of recreational marijuana. So there are some bureaucratic hurdles there as well. You're listening to Where We Live on the phone with us, Dan Adams, cannabis reporter at the Boston Globe. We're talking with him today because uh, July, the month of July, was slated originally for recreational marijuana to be available, uh, ready to be uh, bought by Massachusetts residents and others uh, in the month of July. We're hearing from Dan Adams now that probably the retailers won't be ready to sell for another few weeks. And I'm curious, Dan, what have you been hearing from state residents with all of uh, the delays uh, and all of the uh, the way that they've uh, been uh, dealing with. I mean, how are they feeling about this? Are they impatient? Yes, there is absolutely a growing feeling of impatience. Uh, I think that people feel like they voted for this in, in 2016. I mean, I've, I've even heard from people who have written to me to say, I've never smoked marijuana. I didn't vote for legalization. I have no plans to use it. But nonetheless, I'm frustrated because I feel like the people spoke uh, and they want these stores to roll out. I will say though, that uh, we should put it in context. Marijuana has been illegal in this state for 100 years. Uh, so a few more weeks on top of that uh, <laughs> is probably not going to kill us. Um, I, I would also say people are sort of casting around looking for a villain, looking for someone to blame uh, a, a single state official, a single state agency, or some decision that is the reason uh, we don't have these stores yet. And unfortunately, it's just not that simple. There is no uh, one entity that we can point the finger at uh, quite like that. And the other reality here is people are already using marijuana. They were using it uh, once it became legal just after the uh, uh, vote in 2016. They were using it before that. They were using it before medical, before decriminalization. Marijuana has been around for a long time. And in all likelihood, you know, your neighbors, your colleagues, uh, um, uh, lots of people that you know are already marijuana consumers. They're getting it from, uh, uh, you know, a friend of a friend. They may be growing it at home. Um, So it's not like there's no marijuana uh, in our communities today. Uh, Dan, let's talk about home growing. Uh, And how many uh, people uh, do you anticipate that are actually doing that versus waiting for uh, the ability to buy from one of these retailers? Right. So home growing is legal in Massachusetts. If you live by yourself, you can grow up to six plants. Uh, If you live with another adult, you can grow up to 12 plants. Um, I would say that the majority of people using marijuana today who are not registered patients are probably getting that product on the gray or illicit market, buying it from other people rather than home growing it. But, uh, you know, home home growing is sort of a hobbyist community. Uh, And if you go online, you will find uh, many message boards full of people uh, arguing with each other about the right lights to use, the right soil and fertilizer to use, the uh, cycle of when you turn the lights on and off. This is really uh, sort of a niche uh, uh, thing, but it's growing in popularity. And there's certainly a number of like hydroponic stores and other uh, companies that are trying to take advantage of that uh, phenomenon. And uh, if, you, if you ask for advice on, on home growing, you'll, you'll certainly hear it from, uh, from the folks out there who are experts in it. Uh, Before we get into, you mentioned earlier about uh, uh, bans and moratoriums in certain parts of Massachusetts. I am curious, we know that Massachusetts voters approved this back in 2016, but let's talk about the advantages. What's in it for local communities who who permit these retailers to sell uh, in their towns and cities? Sure. And uh, look, certainly, uh, despite these 
large number of bands and moratoriums, there are some local officials who are downright enthusiastic about this uh, industry. For example, if you talk to Mayor Alex Morse of Holyoke, Massachusetts, he envisions his city uh, you know, unabashedly as a as a capital of uh, cannabis commerce and, and, and is sort of waving the flag and saying, come on down, set up shop here, we want you. Um, from the perspective of folks like uh, Mayor Morse, they're looking at jobs. They are looking for tax revenue. Uh, many of these gateway cities uh, that we have in Massachusetts, we call them, which would be sort of uh, you know mid-sized cities that used to have an industrial uh, base, which may have faded, or you know those jobs went overseas. Uh, they've got large brick warehouses, widening the canals, um, empty real estate. They would love to fill that up with uh, tax-generating, uh, job-generating businesses. Um, and the feeling among those officials, again, is that these are you know, very tightly regulated entities. It's not a free-for-all. Again, we mentioned the background checks, some of the other uh, standards that these companies have to meet. Um, I, I think the question for officials like that is overcoming uh, among their residents. There, there's still concern about this. There's concern about youth access. Um, there's concern about the message that it sends to uh, to younger people. And so they're wrestling that with that politically within their own towns. Uh, but again, certainly there's a number of communities out there that are, are really looking forward to hosting these businesses. And give us an idea of uh, how widespread these bans and moratoriums are. So what, more than 300 uh, towns and cities in the state of Massachusetts, how many of them have enacted uh, either temporary bans or full-out moratoriums? Right. So of the 351 cities and towns in the state, roughly 200 have a, either a ban or a moratorium. Um, it's important to note, though, that you know, many of these moratoriums are going to expire um, either this summer or at the end of this year. And those moratoriums are really intended to be planning periods. They're not a uh, way for people to just kick the can down the road indefinitely. Uh, they have to be using that time to have the conversation, right, to figure out, okay, do we want retail shops uh, in our Main Street district, right downtown, right next to other retailers? Do we want cultivation in only industrial districts? Some towns have sequestered all marijuana uh, businesses out to sort of the remote industrial areas around the edge of town. But you're supposed to be using these moratoriums as a time to have that conversation about where they belong. The expectation in the industry is that uh, many of those will start to go away. And uh, even towns that have indefinite bans may reconsider once they see the guys next door, uh, you know, raking in the tax revenue. Uh, feelings may change. And, and, as, and as these businesses become more normal uh, and less stigmatized within the state, uh, I certainly think that you'll see those local restrictions start to go away. You're listening to Where We Live. Dan Adams on the phone with us, cannabis reporter at the Boston Globe. We're talking about recreational marijuana being legal in Massachusetts. Uh, retailers, again, won't be ready, uh, open and ready uh, for business until a few weeks from now. But if you want to join our conversation, the number 860-275-7266. I know uh, many Connecticut residents are looking uh, to the Bay State neighbor to see uh, how this plays out. Um, also, some of them are probably anticipating driving across the border, Dan. I'm curious, uh, with the law, how does that impact sale to out-of-state residents, and what do they have to worry about coming back into Connecticut? Sure, and I can tell you for a fact that they're looking forward to it, uh, because I get emails from them all the time, uh, just like I do from Massachusetts residents. The, the impatience is, is uh, present there as well. Um, look, this is a little bit of a tricky question. Uh, from the perspective of a marijuana retailer in Massachusetts, they're happy to sell to anybody who's 21 or older and has an ID to prove that. Um, Crossing state lines with it is not something you're supposed to do uh, under federal law. Uh, but then again, you're not supposed to possess this stuff at all under federal law. Um, the truth is, you know, most of New England uh, either has, you know, full legalization or decriminalization of some kind. My practical advice would be to check the laws in your state, see how much you're allowed to possess there, because the limit may be different. But if you, uh, you know, have this stuff uh, sort of bagged up, locked up in the trunk, tucked away somewhere out of sight, you're not using it and uh, driving, which obviously you shouldn't do. Uh, but if you're not consuming it in the car and you're not drawing attention to yourself, it's, I'd say it's unlikely you're going to have a, a run-in with law enforcement. I think generally uh, the police sort of have bigger fish to fry. But again, you've got to be careful about some of these differing laws. So, for example, in New Hampshire, uh, they have decriminalized possession of three quarters of an ounce of marijuana or less. In Massachusetts, uh, you're allowed to travel around with one ounce. 
So if you uh, brought over the three ounces into New Hampshire, you could potentially be running afoul of a real criminal law up there. So you do need to be careful and check those laws. But again, I'd say um, using common sense and erring on the side of discretion and certainly never driving impaired, um, it's unlikely most people are going to have trouble with that. That's an interesting part of uh, this law that I wanted to bring up, Dan, and, and it refers to people who have been affected by the so-called war on drugs, uh, who went to prison uh, because of whether they were selling marijuana or being caught with marijuana. And I'm curious about these equity programs that have been built in uh, to this law and who it will impact. That's right. And I mean, look, we, again, I mentioned we had a cannabis prohibition on the books in Massachusetts for 100 years now, uh, or up until 2016. And by legalizing it, we have essentially admitted as a, as a state, those laws were a mistake. They were not good policy. Uh, and so for people who were arrested uh, under those laws, and, and in many cases are still suffering the consequences, having trouble getting jobs, uh, having that record haunt them, um, there's a there's a very concerted effort underway at the Cannabis Control Commission to address that, to give those people a leg up in the licensing process. Um, and so just recently, the Cannabis Commission launched uh, the so-called equity program. And what it will do is provide technical assistance. So that means uh, job training, mentoring, uh, help finding a loan, help uh, securing real estate, which can be really tricky, help writing a business plan, or for, uh, you know, for workers, for people who may just be coming out of prison. It could be something as simple as, uh, you know, learning to read a bus schedule to get to a job interview on time for a job in the marijuana industry, which is going to need, uh, you know, tens of thousands of workers. Um, and so these these are taxpayer-funded programs, uh, and they're, what they're going to be doing is working with different community groups, different, uh, uh, you know, law firms um, to provide the these services to people who are trying to get in the industry. And again, it spans that full spectrum from um, someone who may just be looking for a job all the way up to someone who may be looking to own and operate his or her own marijuana business. And again, from the perspective of the state, this is a matter of justice. This is a way of saying this policy we had was bad, it was unfair, and, and it affected uh, people of color disproportionately. The statistics are very clear on that, um, that if you, uh, if you are a person of color, your risk of being arrested for possessing marijuana, for selling marijuana, was much higher, even though blacks and whites use and sell marijuana at uh, almost identical rates. Um, so these programs are really targeted at people from these communities that had unusually high, disproportionately high uh, rates of arrest for drug crimes. That's who they're intended to help. And I should say, Connecticut decriminalized marijuana of less than one half ounce back in, in 2011. Before we let you go, Dan, we are curious about what some other industries are feeling about uh, Massachusetts law, again, to legalize recreational marijuana, including the alcohol industry. Are they concerned at all? Yes. And uh, so I, I used to cover the alcohol industry, and I still subscribe to many of these sort of insidery uh, uh, booze industry newsletters. And there's a lot of hand-wringing about this, I'll tell you. Um, they're very worried about it cannibalizing their business. I don't see that happening on a grand scale in the near term. I think, especially if you're like a craft beer maker or somebody like that, um, you are offering something relatively unique. If you have a tap room or something like that, you're offering sort of an experience that can't necessarily be duplicated. And in Massachusetts, they have not yet decided to license uh, so-called social consumption venues or cannabis uh, cafes or pot bars, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so they're not really competing with bars, tap rooms, things like that, in terms of that on-premise experience where you could go out and consume it with your friends in a social setting. But that said, all you have to do is look at how alcohol companies are responding to know that they're nervous about it. Molson Coors just announced that it's making a very large investment in a publicly traded cannabis firm in Canada. They're hedging their bets. Uh, Lagunitas, a uh, beer company out in California, uh, owned, I believe, by the Heineken Company, has uh, just announced that they are releasing a THC-infused drink. It's not alcoholic, uh, but it will be sold in licensed uh, marijuana stores in California. Um, and so there, there are alcohol companies out there making plays in the cannabis space, fearing that loss of business, trying to get ahead of that uh, curve. Dan Adams is cannabis reporter at the Boston Globe. Dan, thanks so much for the update. I guess we'll have to stay tuned for the next few weeks to see uh, which store opens up first in Massachusetts. My pleasure. And maybe I'll see you in line up here, Lizzie. <laughs>
<laughs> this is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathangel. Coming up, are you in a public union? What does the Supreme Court ruling Janice v. AFSCME mean for union members here in Connecticut? We're going to find out after the break. And we want to hear from you, too. Join our conversation, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. If you belong to a public sector union, you're fully aware of the Janice v. AFSCME ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices in a 5-4 decision ruled that a worker cannot be forced to pay a fee to a union because it violates his or her First Amendment rights. Now, what does that mean for the labor movement and the power of collective bargaining in states, including here in Connecticut? Are you a worker who is rethinking whether to have the usual fees deducted from your paycheck to go towards a union? Or does the Janice ruling make you want to fight even harder for the rights of your union to protect your benefits and your workplace conditions. You can join our conversation. We want to hear from you. 860-275-7266. Email where we live at WMPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, for more on that Janice ruling, joining us by phone is Alana Semuels, staff writer at The Atlantic. Alana, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So give us a little background again on this case. It made big news last week, last week rather. Um, I mentioned it was a 5-4 ruling, but it wasn't a ruling that was unexpected. Can you explain? No, I think uh, liberals have been waiting for this for a long time. Um, you know, under this ruling, it overturns a 40-year-old precedent that said that if you're represented by a union, you have to pay fees to cover the cost of bargaining. And, you know, you saw Justice Elena Kagan say in her dissent that conservatives on the court have been embarking on a six-year campaign, basically, to overturn this precedent. So I think everyone was pretty much ready for this to happen. They're just disappointed that it did. Let's talk about that precedence that you mentioned, Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. Um, and again, I know in her dissenting opinion, uh, mentioning that uh, this Abood decision ensured that fees collected by unions would only cover collective bargaining, not political lobbying. But that wasn't the perspective uh, that uh, the opponents uh, to this practice were taking uh, when they were arguing before the Supreme Court. Yeah, that's, I think, what's made a lot of unions kind of scratch their heads. In the 1977 case, the court said, okay, you know, if unions are going to collect these fees, they can't use the fees to do lobbying or political campaigning. The fees just can be used to cover the cost of collective bargaining. Because whether you're a member of a union or you're represented by a union, the union's still going to bargain on behalf of you for wages and benefits. Um, and so the court in 1977 said, you know what, that's pretty expensive to do that collective bargaining, and people shouldn't just be able to get that for free. Uh, you know, economists say that they are going to be kind of what they call free riders who aren't paying anything but are benefiting from, from unions. And, you know, that was accepted for, for four decades. And then all of a sudden, from, from unions' perspective, the court says, you know what, even paying for collective bargaining violates your First Amendment rights because maybe you don't agree for, that you want higher wages. And that was actually the argument of the plaintiff, Mark Janice. He said, you know, the state of Illinois is having budget problems. I don't want a higher wage, which, you know, sounds a little crazy to, to some people who say who wouldn't want a higher wage, especially if you're a public sector employee. But, you know, this time the court agreed with him and said, OK, you know, maybe you don't want the unions to bargain on behalf of you and you shouldn't you shouldn't have to pay for that benefit. Mm. Now, Alana, how does this, uh, again, this ruling play out in states? Because we know there are states that are considered right to work, others in D.C. are considered fair share. Can you describe the differences? Sure. So no matter what, you're going to be represented by a union. Um, in in um, some states, you in all states, you can also decide to be a member of a union. Anywhere you live, you can say, I want to be a member, I'm going to pay the fees. But in some states, um, if you decide not to be a member, you still have to pay fees to be represented by that union until now. Um, in other states, you did not have to pay fees to be represented by that union. Those are called right-to-work states. And Janus for public sector unions essentially makes every state a right-to-work state, meaning if you don't want to pay fees to the union, even if the union represents you, you don't have to. 
Now, um, we want to talk, we want to bring in the union perspective here in Connecticut. On the phone with us here on Where We Live Now is Jody Barr, Executive Director of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 4. Jody, welcome to the show. Hello, welcome. So tell us a reaction um, from your specific union to the Janus uh, decision, Jody. Uh, I think as Alana had said, we, we had been expecting this for quite some time. You know, it was probably a six-year campaign. We knew the minute that... Uh, the recent president was elected that we were going to be facing this in a matter of time. So tell us a little bit more about you've been preparing for this decision. So have you been talking with your membership and and what have they been telling you? Yeah, so we have about 30,000 members. We have been engaging in one-on-one conversations with as many of them as we can and we're just narrowing down the list and, and basically checking everyone off. And a lot of them, you know, the best way to describe it is this decision sort of poked a bear. Our members are, are frustrated, and they keep asking us, how is this fair? How, why is this, how did this happen? Um, and I think it's engaged them to become more involved in the overall union and, and the goals and values that we believe in. So from our end, it's just been one-on-one conversations with the members explaining the values of the union and, and how sticking together sort of makes us all stronger and gives us a, a voice. Um, explain to us how you uh, carry on that message of the value of a union. So not look, talking about more than just uh, the wages that you receive uh, from doing a job, but um, tell us how you, I guess, market the union uh, to your membership, why it's important to be uh, paying, paying uh, these fees to help with collective bargaining. Correct. So we go through you know, a list of what the union has brought to uh, unionized workers and all workers, um, everything from, you know, the 40-hour work week going through history, the, you know, paid holidays, sick time, family leave, things like that. And then we bring it into more reality when we look at things like the most recent uh, CBAC agreement where, you know, the state was just about $5 billion in the hole and state employees coughed up about a third of that. And we explained to them that had we not, you know, basically 2% of the population, had they not coughed up one-third of the problem or solution, um, the state probably, if it wasn't for unions, could have taken half of it from state employees. Uh, so how much are you expecting to lose uh, due to the Janus ruling, Jody? I, so that's a two-sided answer, I guess. The first is we're probably going to lose immediately about 5 to 10% of our membership. But through this, what we're, we're seeing, both by the members being sort of motivated and moving forward, our organization being motivated, we're going to organize. And I think that in the end, we will we'll have more members than we started with at the day of this decision. Mm. That's interesting that you brought that up because I wanted to go back to uh, Alana Samuels, again, a staff writer, reporter at The Atlantic. We're talking about the Janus v. AFSCME uh, decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, So unions, uh, public sector unions across the country will now take a hit with the fees that they've been collecting to help with collective bargaining. Um, We just heard Jody here in Connecticut, Alana, say that they're expecting membership uh, to increase. And I'm curious if you could talk about uh, I guess, a, a case that w- where they saw that actually happen and in California. It was Harris v. Quinn. Yeah, right. So in 2014, the Supreme Court ruled in Harris v. Quinn that home health aides uh, couldn't be required to pay fair share fees that violated their First Amendment rights to free speech. So this did basically what Janus does now. Uh, it ended their ability to collect fair share fees. Um, and right after the ruling, the union, which had about uh, the United Domestic Workers Union of America, which represented home care workers, specifically in California, it lost about 20,000 members. So it went from 68,000 to 48,000. Um, but today it actually has 75,000 dues paying members. So it was able to, through a lot of activism and, and talking to members, it was able to increase its membership. On the other hand, um, you could argue that it increased its membership because there are more home health aides in California than there were in 2014 because of the aging population. Um, there are 108,000 potential home care workers. So, yes, unions are able to increase membership, and, and that's great, but it's probably still not going to be to the degree that it was uh, had this had the Supreme Court not ruled this way in Janice. 
Uh, we heard uh, uh, Jody Barr again here in Connecticut, Executive Director of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 4, um, estimating that they expect to lose 5 to 10 percent uh, of membership uh, in the immediate future. But when we look nationwide, um, what are unions expecting to lose in terms of membership and dollars, again, that are used towards collective bargaining, Alana? A lot of uh, national unions have bargained or have budgeted for about 30 percent uh, lower revenues uh, post Janus. And there's a study out of the University of Illinois um, that found that the union membership of state and local government employees could fall by about eight percentage points or about 700,000 members. Um, So that's that's a pretty big um, drop. And, you know, I think unions are going to have to work pretty hard to to combat that. And that's going to be harder for them because they have lower revenues. Mm. Now, looking at the, the, again, the consequences of this Janus decision, I mean, is it um, realistic to see that because of this, you could see lower pay and benefits for public sector employees? Is that a fair yeah, statement? Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's definitely, you know, in, in most places where this is, this type of ruling has gone down, um, wages and benefits have, have declined. The same study estimates that wages of of government employees would drop by about 3% and salaries of public school teachers would drop by about 5%. Mm. And can you talk a little bit more, Alana, about how uh, unions have been shifting their message? Again, they they were expecting this uh, to happen, uh, the Janus decision uh, to be in this manner. So I'm just curious what else they've been, uh, how they've been kind of marketing. I asked that to Jody here locally, but nationally, how we're seeing unions shifting their messaging. Yeah, I mean, I think what what Jody said is is happening nationwide. They're having these one-on-one talks with members, asking them to recommit. Um, And they're kind of shifting their message, not just saying, we can get you higher wages and benefits, but also saying, you know what, we make make your work better. We make your workplace better, and we also make things better for your clients, your students, the people you work with. You know, you saw in the home health care in California, they really talked about not just about the workers, but about advocating on behalf of their clients and making sure that their clients get adequate funding. You know, you see teachers unions talking not just about getting better wages and benefits for teachers, but also advocating on behalf of students or undocumented students or equity and funding. So, you know, this really appeals to people who believe that in in kind of equality and the equality that unions have provided for, for decades. So it's not just about themselves. It's kind of about this idea of social justice. Mm. Uh, you can join our conversation here on Where We Live, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. We especially want to hear from you if you're a member of a public uh, public sector union. I mean, how are you feeling about the Janice v. AFSCME decision? Are you rethinking about uh, the fees that you've been paying to your union? Again, we want to hear from you at 860-275-7266. Jody Barr, I wanted to go back to you. Um, you mentioned uh, in the immediate future seeing 5 to 10 percent of your membership being lost. I'm just curious if there's a generational shift there. Do you find it harder to talk about the the value of a union to younger workers versus someone who's been on the job for decades? Uh, I would say we look at it more as opportunity. The the newer generation, you can communicate with them any way you want, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, instant messaging. Any way you reach out to them, they're responding immediately. And their ability, so... When you go and get a, a, a millennium, so to say, fired up about an issue, they've immediately posted it, and now 5,000 of their friends see it. A couple of people share it. Now your, your reach is 20,000 people in a matter of a couple of minutes. So we're actually loving the younger generation to be able to communicate, and it's the older generation that gets a lot of the values. Can you give us an idea uh, for those of us who aren't members of a public sector union when we're talking about uh, fees being deducted from a paycheck? How much are we talking about? So the the total amount is about five hundred dollars a year per member. So dividing that down, it's you know it, it's it's a cup of coffee a day. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to go back to our reporter on the line from the Atlantic, Alana Samuels. You know, we're talking about this decision on public sector unions. Any impact at all on the private sector? No, this is completely separate from private sector. So private sector unions are still governed by right-to-work laws, 
but this decision um, was specifically about public sector unions. Mm. And what will you be watching for in the next weeks and months, Alana, again, from this decision by the U.S. Supreme Court? I mean, I think what's going to be interesting is to see the degree to which conservative, the conservatives who were really pushing for Janus are going to go after other um, labor and, and union standards. Um, you know, in, in a lot of states, the switch to right to work wasn't a huge blow. But if you look at the state of Wisconsin, um, they they severely limited collective bargaining for public sector employees. They They just passed all these laws that really made it unpleasant for unions to operate and made it, made it really hard for unions to do anything. And in Wisconsin, the share of union membership has just plummeted. Um, and teachers especially are really seeing lower pay. Their, their median salaries fell about 12%. So I think if we're going to continue to see assaults on union nationwide, which would not be surprising given this administration and, and the makeup of the Supreme Court, I think things could get a lot worse for unions. Janus is perceived as a pretty big blow, but if, if these attacks continue, unions are going to have to spend a lot of their money trying to defend them instead of you know on, on other causes, and it's going to be really hard to, to keep fighting with diminishing resources. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jody Barr, uh, here in Connecticut, uh, we know uh, the state budget crisis isn't going to get better anytime soon. You mentioned the CBAC agreement. When does that expire? And then is there concern, uh, because under Governor Malloy, we've seen uh, the state workforce uh, shrink and with finances not (laughs) projected to improve in the next several years. I mean, how will, again, this decision impact uh, the power of the union to collectively bargain uh, in the future? So... The the agreement expires in 2027. The the unions themselves, so AFSCME is joining in with other, you know, larger international unions, and we're trying to figure out the best ways that we can address not only going forward what we could be facing, as Alana had pointed out, with possible future attacks, but we're also just trying to address the issues that we have now and how to sort of collectively handle them and not everyone uh, recreate the wheel. Mm. When you say issues you're having now, what are those issues? It, it would just be the Janus decision and mm. sort of figuring out, even though the decision's been out for a, uh, a few days, we're not sure of exactly how it's all going to roll out and some of the implications of it and how things will actually happen. And we're still working out a lot of those details. And that's something I believe uh, the governor's uh, budget office is also uh, working out the details, OPM? Correct. So, you know, one quick example is the decision went into effect, and then what happens to wages that were sort of collect uh, that were paid before that? So if you worked, you know, three days before it and those dues were taken out, do those still come to the union? Does the state hold on to them? Does the union obtain them? Do we give them back? What is is the right thing to do? And we're just trying to follow the federal law and work with the the governor as a a mandatory subject to bargaining about how to deal with this. Jody Barr again is executive director of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Council 4. Jody, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Also, Alana Samuels joined us, staff writer at The Atlantic. We'll tweet out some of her stories at Where We Live. Alana, thank you for your perspective. You're welcome. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Up next, have you heard of prison gerrymandering? What does it mean? And why is Connecticut being sued over it? We're going to learn more after the break, and we want to hear from you, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Now, should a prisoner be counted as a resident in the town he or she is from or at the prison he or she is housed in temporarily? And what does that mean for community in terms of representation and government dollars it receives? Those are some of the questions behind a practice known as prison gerrymandering. And the state of Connecticut is now being sued over it. For more, joining us by phone, Brad Berry, General Counsel for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Inc., or NAACP. Brad, welcome to our show. Thank you. So the NAACP last week uh, filed a lawsuit in federal court over this practice called prison gerrymandering. For some of our listeners, they may have never heard that term before. Please describe what we're talking about. Okay. Well, we start with the principle that um, everybody is entitled to equal representation. And that sort of flows from the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. 
And what that means in the redistricting uh, context is that um, each district should be of roughly equal size. Um, you know, if that weren't the case, you would have, uh, you know, um, you, you would violate the principle of, of one person, one vote. So, uh, so, so legislative districts should be of roughly equal size, and then, you know, people vote and they send their representative to, uh, up to, uh, to Hartford, and, um, and you know, they, they carry out the people's business. Um, what happens with regard to prison gerrymandering is that you have a prison population in Connecticut uh, and in many other states that's largely African American and Latino, and which hail uh, predominantly from urban urban centers in Connecticut, such as Bridgeport, New Haven, and Hartford. Um, however, the state has chosen to locate its prisons. Um, in rural areas uh, that are mostly clustered in the, you know, in the northern region of the state, nor- northern central region of the state, and when those, uh, when when the when the legislature is drawing legislative districts, so so the state legislature is the is the body that does that. They then count the prisoners not as being, you know, um, they they don't count them at their pre-incarceration address. Instead, they count them as residing uh, in the locations where the prisons are located, and that results in a that results in a skewing uh, of of, uh, of of power, electoral power, uh, towards the rural areas, and it results in a dilution, really, of the of the voting strength uh, in urban centers. So, uh, prison gerrymandering refers to that practice of counting prisoners. Uh, when you're doing redistricting, uh, drawing the legislative uh, uh, the le- legislative map, uh, you know what's going to be in District Five as opposed to District Six. Um, uh, when you do that, we believe that you should count prisoners as as being uh, residents of the places where they came from, rather than the places where the prisons are located. Now, Brad, you're with the National NAACP. This is a practice, prison uh, gerrymandering uh, practiced in states across the country. Why target Connecticut specifically in this lawsuit? Well, um, Connecticut has some of the worst distortions of, uh, of voting districts that we've seen. Um, you know, when you when you take the uh, the prison population and you assign them uh, to the to the areas that they that they lived in, the places they call home, you have a distortion of as much as 15 percent between the most crowded uh, districts and the least crowded districts, um, and that distortion is one of the things that led us to um, uh, to uh, uh, designate Connecticut as the first state that we would we would sue for engaging in this practice. But I want to point out that, you know, um, we are continuing to look at other states. Uh, we are seriously uh, exploring uh, the possibility of filing suit against other states that engage in this practice. Uh, so we we hope that, that Connecticut doesn't feel terribly picked on because um, they're certainly not alone in this practice. Can we talk about the states that have uh, voluntarily addressed this issue of prison gerrymandering? I understand uh, from reporting in the New Haven Independent here in Connecticut that for several legislative sessions, this issue has come up and it has not been addressed. Yeah, it, it's come up in Connecticut several times. Bills have been introduced in the in the um, in the Connecticut House. And they have been, um, they've not gone anywhere. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons that we, you know, we, we had to, that, that's the primary reason we had to resort to the courts. I mean, we would have much preferred it if Connecticut um, had chosen to deal with this issue before now, uh, legislatively. Um, but the fact that they didn't do that and haven't done it over, you know, um, several sessions really left us with no recourse but to resort to the courts um, and you know the the you know other states have other states have chosen to address this problem legislatively um, uh, Maryland and Delaware and New York for example and there and there are a few other states as well that have chosen to address this this problem legislatively um, and you know uh, you know Connecticut could still choose to do that um, but you know, unless and until um, the situation is remedied through a, le- a legislative solution, you know, we, we have to uh, we have to slug it out in the courts. Mm.
On the phone with me is Brad Berry, General Counsel for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Inc., or the NAACP. We're talking with him today because last week the NAACP sued Connecticut over how the state counts its prisoners when crafting legislative districts, arguing that urban districts are weakened while rural districts with fewer minorities are unfairly benefiting from a practice known as prison gerrymandering, again, uh, counting inmates as residents of the town where the prison resides versus their, their official home town or home address. And I'm curious, uh, we, we did uh, reach out to the Governor Malloy's office, and uh, the, the uh, response we got was uh, they don't comment on pending litigation, but the governor's office is reviewing the filing. Uh, you mentioned that uh, other states are, are doing this practice, Brad, and the NAACP is looking at them as well as possible uh, targets of a lawsuit. This is something that you hope to resolve at the state level, not something that you want to see go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court because of the way... Uh, the makeup is now well i mean we're not you know we we hope to get this issue resolved as quickly as possible um and we're we're certainly not afraid of going to the u.s supreme court on this issue but the first thing that we have to do is to persuade uh, uh the united states district judge to whom the case has been assigned that the practice is unconstitutional um you know, we we you know if the, if an appeal is taken from that decision uh, by either party, we then have to talk to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, um, and only if um, then the U.S. Supreme Court decided to accept the case uh, would we uh, would we be you know arguing to the Supreme Court. So, you know, the Supreme you know any any um, you know any consideration by this case of this case by the Supreme Court is a long way off. We're not really thinking about the Supreme Court right now with regard to this issue. What we're thinking about is the residents of um, the state of Connecticut uh, who live in urban centers, uh, and we're thinking about the prisoners who are residing in, 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 in or who are, who are assigned, rather, to Connecticut con- correctional facilities um, and making sure that, um, that they, are, they are represented equally um, as other residents of the state. Um, so you know it, it's um, you know the the Supreme Court is very much in the press right now. We're certainly concerned about uh, what President Trump is going to do, who he's going to nominate, and then you know whether the Senate will concern will confirm that that nominee. Uh, but that is a separate issue from from this lawsuit, which you know is is you know is is very much you know probably would never get to the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, and even if it does, you know, we'll make our arguments there, and, and we would hope that the Supreme Court would see it our way. Mm. Prison gerrymandering, just one issue that the NAACP is looking at in terms of this ongoing uh, conversation about voter suppression in this country. Can you explain um, some other issues that you're focusing on? Yeah, well, you know, there are just, you know, a number of methods that um, that um, some state legislatures are using to try to suppress the uh, the vote in um, in communities of color. Um, you might recall that a couple of years ago we had a case out of North Carolina that got to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and then you know review was not accepted by the Supreme Court in that case, but. That was a case where um, this, the state of North Carolina had imposed photo ID requirements, you know, had restricted early voting, um, same-day registration, had really employed a bevy of um, restrictions that um, discovery in the case revealed were designed, intentionally designed to suppress the vote um, in communities of color. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we've seen that we're seeing those kinds of uh, tactics being used in, in various states, and where we see them, we fight them. Um, in addition, you know, the, uh, an overarching issue is making certain that communities of color are counted fairly in the census, mm-hmm. um, because, you know, uh, this issue of redistricting, all, you know, starts with the census. Um, and if communities of color are undercounted in the census, then that means that their their voting strength um, is going to be diluted when the maps are drawn. Mm. Um, so we actually filed a lawsuit a couple of months ago uh, with the assistance of the Rule of Law Clinic at Yale Law School 
to require the Census Bureau and the Department of Commerce, of which the Census Bureau is a part, to do everything in their power to make certain that communities of color are fairly counted in the 2020 census. Um, so we, we, we see, you know, starting from the census and then getting down to, you know, things like, uh, you know, photo ID requirements, uh, uh, you know, restrictions on early voting, uh, restrictions on the number of satellite voting locations. Uh, Brad you know, Berry, uh, unfortunately, yeah. we got to leave it there, but we appreciate you coming on to talk about this NAACP lawsuit against the state of Connecticut over prison gerrymandering. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Today's show produced by uh, Lydia Brown. Special thanks to Jason Perez, uh, Carlos Mejia, and Katie Talarski. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening. <laughs>